Okay, I'm Dick Monfort, uh, currently uh, the chairman and CEO of the Colorado Rockies. So back uh, back after Denver got the the team, there was a group of guys from Columbus or yeah, Columbus, Ohio, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, they were going to be the general partners. Jerry McMorris was given the task to come up with the additional money, which was the bulk of the money. Uh, to finish finish out the franchise fee. And he came to my father, Ken Monfort, and said, hey, would you be interested in uh, you know, investing in the team? And after he gave him the lay of the land, and you'll be a limited partner, you have no control, you have no this, you have no that, uh, my dad declined. Uh, and Jerry said, well, what about your boys? And he said, well, you can talk to them. Dick will probably tell you no, and Charlie will probably tell you yes. And that's exactly what happened. And the reason I didn't get involved uh, at the time was because it was a limited partnership. I was running a big beef company in, in Greeley and uh, just, you know, didn't seem like the right investment. Um, Charlie got involved because he, he was more involved in Denver and just felt like, you know, uh, it was a good thing for Denver. And, and he was right. Um, so then things changed quickly. The, the guys from... Ohio got in big trouble and all of a sudden now they have to raise not only the money for the limited partnerships but they had to raise the money to buy the general partnership. I often wonder if Jerry would have come to me and said hey you can be a general partner you'll have authority to make decisions and stuff maybe it would have been a different story. Uh, probably wouldn't have been but uh, as it ended up, it became a lot better deal for the people that invested, uh, particularly Charlie, Jerry, and Orrin Benton, who stepped up and bought the general partnership shares. Um, so at, at that point in time, uh, there were actually four uh, general partners. It was Charlie, Jerry, Orrin Benton, and Kerry Taraji. And Kerry had gotten in um, somehow down the way um, but it was a pretty uh, pretty small group and uh, a lot of things changed uh, before baseball was was started in Colorado but uh, you know it was a good group of people so so um, Neil has done a little bit of research on uh, you and your brother and do you want to go over those facts and just re-verify with Dick, if they're accurate? Right. It, it, it sounds like in 1992, that's um, when McMorris talked to Charlie about getting involved, and he got right. involved with Benton. Right. Okay. Um, and then you you really got involved in 97? Uh, yeah, I mean, so in 95, Jerry had, Jerry and Charlie, or Jerry and Oren both had some financial difficulties with their, with their, uh, other businesses and so in 95 uh, Jerry came to me and was interested in a loan um, and I had gotten closer to Jerry over the years because I would go to games and I would talk to Jerry and stuff and so I talked to my dad we made the loan part of the collateral of the loan of course was stock in, in the team and I made sure that some of that stock was general partnerships shares uh, the bulk of it was limited partnership shares. And as time went on, um, Jerry transferred that stock to us uh, to take care of the debt. And then Oren uh, actually went into bankruptcy. And so between 95 and 97 is when uh, bought a portion of Jerry's stock and then um, bought all of Oren Benton's general partnership shares and the club bought uh, Oren's limited shares. I used to call it treasury stock, which I was told by our accountant that's not what it was, but it, it acted right. the same way. The company took that stock back. And uh, then that stock later, in probably 2002 or three, was sold to Fox, the TV company. And then over time, I bought that, those shares back from Fox as well. So, you started to get actively involved in 97? No, in 97, I mean, 
Jerry was the acting partner. He was, uh, he was the day-to-day -day guy, I believe. He was the CEO. Uh, I didn't really, I, when I got involved officially in 97, although it was probably a little before that, uh, I was a very passive owner. And that's not really in my DNA, but I didn't know enough about baseball. I had two young, three young kids, two of them that played baseball. One was a, a daughter that didn't play baseball, but uh, so, um, <clears throat> You know, we went to games and, you know, became good fans and would set through maybe a meeting a month or quarterly meetings and, but really had no reason to, to get involved much. Um, I had other things going on, so it was fine. And then in, after September 11th of 2001, things, you know, our entire world changed for all of us. And uh, the club had uh, really been borrowing money to cover its losses, and our, so our, our borrowings had gone up every year, which was sort of typical for baseball teams. And uh, the bank pretty much said, listen, that's the end of that. And so uh, at that point in time, we decided there was a need for a capital call. And uh, so Charlie and I, made that capital call. Jerry didn't, uh, so he got diluted. And then, oh, probably 2002, two, three is when Charlie and I bought Jerry out. Do you think at that time that Jerry knew he was sick, or do you think no. his business no, he, was just yeah. having he, a tough time? Yeah, it, it had been having a tough time. And you know what? He had, he had uh, run the club for 10 years, done a pretty good job. I mean, you know, our attendance speaks for itself, um, but he had done a good job, and maybe there is a, a lifespan on that. No, but he wasn't sick at that point in time. He was, he was doing well, and you know what? It was time for him to step down, and he had some other interests that he wanted to do, and had made some money on it. So it, it was, it was. So all he good. essentially ran the ownership group for the first ten years. Yes, roughly. yeah, yeah, and, and really, if you look at it, that. You know, our first game was in 93, right? and Jerry from 92 on, so, you know, it was a good 10 or 11 years that he was in charge of it. Okay, and did Kelly McGregor then get involved? Yeah, so Kelly bit? got hired in the mid-90s uh, by Jerry. Jerry's son and Kelly were really good friends at CSU. Uh, Kelly had a background, he was a, a athletic background, he was the... Uh, uh, athletic director at Arkansas, and the, our assistant athletic director at Arkansas, then the assistant athletic director at Florida. He had always wanted to come back to Colorado. Jerry hired Kelly to run the business part of the Rockies. So we had a business part with Kelly, and uh, at the time uh, a baseball part under Bob Gebhardt. And so yeah, he got hired to do that. Um, and then you know, when Jerry left, Kelly was the natural to take over Jerry's day-to-day -day responsibilities uh, of the club. So Kelly did that for two or three years? He, no, he probably did that for, I would say it, that happened in 2002, three, right in that time frame, and then he passed away in 10, so it was seven or eight years oh, that so he, he did, did it. Oh, so he did for that long? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we were, we were the first club to really integrate things, actually, Kelly and, and at now, fast forward, Dan O'Dowd was the general manager, right. came to me and said, Here, here's what we'd like to do. Um, and it made sense. So Kelly was over both. He was over, he became truly the CEO and the baseball guys reported to him as did the business people. Hmm. And then in 2005, you pr purchased McMorris's? Yes. Start. So he was basically there right. ten, 10 years plus a little bit. Right, yeah, and, and it took us a while to negotiate with Jerry, the sale of his stock. He wanted, uh, you know, we had offered him a price that we thought was fair. I mean, the company was in pretty dire straits. I mean, we had a lot of debt. We had all just made a big capital call. Uh, whoever was going to come in was going to be, a, you know, not a control person, was going to be a minority investor. 
Uh, and so it was a difficult thing to sell and we even had to go to the commissioner in Milwaukee, Bud Selig, and you know, plead our case on what our purchase price was. And so it took, it took some time to get that done and then um, we got that done. 2005 sounds right and Jerry, Jerry moved on. No, okay, because from the outside, it's, you know, it kind of seemed like everything was running fine, but I guess it was a little financially tighter. Than yeah, I mean, I think nobody likes to put their dirty laundry out, right? Sure. And, uh, you know, they, we were very successful at the gate. Now, by then, you know, we were, we sold out at, at a Mile High Stadium and had tremendous crowds. And, you know, we set records that will never be broken because there's never going to be an 80,000 seat yeah. stadium again. And then um, when we moved, you know, so that was honeymoon one, a couple years at Mile High Stadium. Honeymoon number two was when we got Coors Field downtown and we had sellouts from 95 through really 98. Um, in fact, Coors Field, the, the architects had told us, okay, you need a stadium that's 42,000. And Jerry and Charlie at the time, because I wasn't involved, uh, they put in $15 million more dollars uh, to make the stadium 50000 rather than forty-two, dollars um, Because of, you know, we're drawing 80, 75 to 80000 right. at mile high, so why not do it? And I, I remember Jerry saying, you know, it paid for itself in, in two years. And he's probably right. I never did the math. But... Those extra 8,000 seats, which were sold out for three or four years, uh, did pay for themselves. Now, the problem is, as the honeymoons and all that wore out and the size of Denver, you know, the, the, the architects, I don't always say they're right, but they were probably right. The size of the stadium should be 42,000. And as years went on, you know, uh, the right field, right center field, uh, those the third tier, which is what they added, plus the rock pile, which is what they added because they had a rock pile at mile high. Those were the seats they added. And those seats were, other than four or five times a year, were empty. And uh, oh, really? yeah, from probably 2000 till 2013 when we took them out. We could never figure out what to do with them. Other cities like Oakland and Tampa had covered them with a tarp. We just basically left them empty. And, and it wasn't good, and it, it, it didn't shrink the amount of available tickets, so people always knew they could get a ticket, which gave us no pricing power. So when we took those out and made that that rooftop area, it, it helped in a lot of ways. It helped get a new generation of fans, the millennials that like to stand around and, and watch a game. Uh, and it, you know, it made it a lot more attractive than empty seats. Up so there. you're happy with that decision? Yeah, I mean, it, people say that had to be a, a, a big money winner and it, it was good. It was, it was, you know, it wasn't the best investment we ever made because we did sell those seats opening day, the two or three fireworks games, if the Yankees were in town or Boston was in town, something like that. So we did sell them, let's say, five or six times a year. There's 3,500 seats, and if we're getting $10, you know. So we had to overcome that cost, and then the cost of doing it was pretty significant as well. But no, it's, it's great. It's great for the stadium, and it's great to get that other that other group of uh, fans in there. Yeah, we've been up there, and I, yeah. I agree, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, a, it's like two different experiences, yeah. rather than sitting right. in the seats and being up there. Right, I mean, I tell people, you know, I'm 63 years old, I would no more stand and watch a game for three hours than the man <laughs> in the moon. The millennials would not no more longer sit in a seat right. for three hours right. and watch a game. So, you know, it, it's, it, it's, you try to make the stadium fit, you know, all your constituents. So when did you start to really spend Be, a significant Before you ask that question, just talking about attendance for a moment, do you think there was a drop-off because there was such a, a long time before um, Major League Baseball expanded uh, into Florida and to uh, uh, Denver, then 
turned right around and expanded into Phoenix. Right. Do you think that was an impact? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the size of Denver and the size of the stadium was probably the biggest thing. You know, we play, there are times where we play 10 games in 10 days. And we had a great se season ticket base. And most of our season ticket base was people that shared, right? Right. right. So you bought four right. season right. tickets yeah. and you shared with five people. Well, one of those people would drop off. And then maybe another one of those people would drop off for whatever reason. They moved, they didn't want to make the investment, whatever it was, they would drop off. So the, you went from four to two. So. It, it just could never hold up that long, not in, not in the city the size it was then, or probably even the size it is now. Uh, and then we had such early success in 95, we got to the playoffs. So everybody just sort of felt, well, this is going to be an everyday occurrence. You know, it, the Broncos seem to be successful year after year. The, the Rockies are going to be successful. And because we hadn't really built a good farm system, we were at the mercy of uh, the free agents, and we had a half a dozen free agents that we signed. Uh, some of them didn't pan out. The team wasn't that good. So I think, I think there, you know, the fact that we didn't win after '95 again uh, sort of cooled Created some, some people. Yeah, and then just the fact that the new the honeymoon wore out. Uh, I don't think it was any more than that. You know, last year and in 2007 and 2008 when we had great teams, it, it's tough to get, you know, 45,000 people every night. Especially, you know, the weekends are pretty good. But a Tuesday night in April is a, you know, you got kids in school, yeah. the same thing in August and September. It's, it's tough to get, you know, 45,000 people. So, um, you know, we, we are the... I believe we're the 19th largest market, and that's counting two in, you know, maybe we're not the 19th largest market, but you got two teams in New York, you got two teams in Chicago, you do got two teams in Los Angeles, you got two teams in the Oakland area. So if you take those, if you add those eight, then there's 11 teams from other cities that are bigger than us. So we're 19th in, in size, and last year we drew eight. Uh, and we're usually 8 to 11, 8 to 12. So we draw really good for right. our size. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's probably what we are and who we are. So, sorry. So, oh, so, um, so when did you personally get more involved? Get, get more involved. Yeah, so after, after the bank meeting, um, I had start, started getting a little more involved in the early 2000s and then especially after 2001 I got a lot more involved because we were, you know, we were losing money and I just, the, the, the economy, you know, the, not only September 11th happened but the dot com bubble hit, right. you know, the economy was in sort of a soft patch and I was worried that, you know, financially, you know, were we really doing everything we could and so I started getting involved then and then when Jerry stepped down um, uh, Charlie became the chairman um, but it was more Kelly and I really involved in a day-to-day -day basis and trying to figure out how we could wrestle that this was thing in down. 2005 or yeah, yeah probably yeah, I mean, I think Kelly was more involved before that, but you, you've got the dates, so you're right. And Kelly had been coming, be, had become a more of a force, uh, and you know, so we had to stop the free agent signings. We had to get to where we were building a great farm system. Uh, we're a mid-market team in the early days because of our our attendance. And the fact that TV was not as big a deal, the, the regional sports deal, we were a big market team because of our attendance. But as time went on, we were really a mid-market team acting like we were a large market team. Exactly, exactly. So then in 2011, you took over? Yeah, after Kelly passed away, you know, we had, uh, we had three options. I like to say there were three options. We had... Um, Greg Fiesel, who had taken over as 
the business side when Kelly took over as CEO, Dan O'Dowd on the baseball side. Um, you know, we could have uh, at, at, we could have elevated one of those guys. We could have gone to the outside. We were very concerned going to the outside that we had built a really good culture there and still have an incredible culture. Um, and anytime you bring somebody from the outside, they can tell you all the right things when they're talking about what they're going to do. But the fact of the matter is you, you run that risk. Or uh, Charlie and I talked, I was willing to, to step in and do it. And so that's what I did. And, and you know, I didn't take people, I didn't ever take Kelly's job. Nobody could have really taken Kelly's job. I just got the management there and said, okay, everybody steps up. And there's things that I'll have to do. Um, I didn't like going to owner meetings, so I started <laughs> going to owner meetings and getting involved with baseball and, and just doing the, some of the things, peripheral deals that he did. And then everybody else just had to step up and be responsible and take on uh, more duties. And that's really what happened. And uh, it, it's worked out good. I mean, uh, I, I miss Kelly every day. I mean, Kelly and I talked every day. And so I always, and he was a pretty good talker. And so I always had to fill that hour void every day when we'd sit down and chat or talk on the phone. So yeah, but that was 2000. Actually, he passed away in April. and. So I did it in 2010, starting in 2010. Hmm. So what's it, I mean, you were in the meatpacking business. When did you get out of the meatpacking business? So we, in 1987, we sold the company to ConAgra, which right. was an Omaha company. Uh, I stayed there until 95. I left, so I was doing other things after 95, uh, enjoying my kids a little bit. And, traveling a little more, but I had some other businesses that I ran. Um, so I, I basically got out in 1995. Okay, so then you were free to move, yeah, move yeah. into the situation. Right, yeah. and in 2010, you know, my kids were, you know, had moved out of the house, were either in college or, or working, and so I, I had more time, and that's, that's how I filled it, I guess. So what's it like to go to the Major League Baseball meetings and mingle with all these owners that have been around forever? Yeah, you know, what's funny is if, if I look at the owners that are there at the meetings now, and I'm just going back to 2010. I mean, I've been an owner since 97, but if I go back to just 2010, I got, you know, there's not a lot of people with more tenure than I have. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And if you go back to 97, you know, there's probably a handful of people that have been involved or been the control person of their team for longer than that. So, um, you know, at first it was difficult. You know, you sort of feel like you're, you know, you don't know anybody when you have, you have lunch and you have dinner and you have breakfast and, you know, when you don't know anybody, you sort of sit out and you sort of feel like the fifth wheel. But uh, over time, I mean, I, um, the commissioner, Commissioner Selig and I, because of our negotiation on Jerry Stock, uh, Bud and Jerry were very close, we didn't s start off on really the right foot. And um, so it took me a little while to say, well, you know what, it's better to, join him than try to beat him. So I got involved. I got to know Bud a lot better when there was a search for the new commissioner. There were five owners that were put on the committee and I was one of them. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, um, I get along good with most of the guys. Uh, you know, they're all a little different, different walk of life, different egos, uh, different I, I I would doubt there's anybody that's as involved in the team as I am. Um, so um, you know, I, I think uh, I think I'm respected there. I I respect others there. So it, it it's decent. So are there any particular issues you've taken on or committees? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the picking the new commissioner was was a big one, um, and then. Uh, 
Uh, two years ago, I was put on the Labor Committee, and so I was part of the Labor Committee that negotiated our last uh, uh, CBA, which happened two years ago, December. Um, so that was a big deal. It took a lot of time, and it was, it was difficult, it was hard work, it was long nights, a lot of sitting around, but uh, it taught me a lot. Um, and now, I, am, I was just one of the committee members, and now I'm the chairman of that committee. Of the Labor Committee? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's the highest profile yeah. focus in Major League Baseball, well, especially every five, every five years. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, and um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of intricacies to this. I mean, it's pensions, it's meal, it, it's there's so much stuff that is negotiated that it's uh, it's uh, it's incredible. So you know, talking about. Um, it was one thing to get a Major League Baseball team, and I think it's certainly another to keep a Major League right. Baseball team. And I know that Neil and I certainly had a challenge when uh, we were doing the legislation because we didn't know what the cost was going to be, the franchise right. fee, or what it would cost um, certainly right. to build the stadium. And we right. were certainly in a major, major uh, recession that, at, that right. lasted a long time. And as you now see, it sounds like the ownership group had similar issues and problems right. of, you know, you just don't know what, what it's going to take to sustain over right. time. And you see even uh, when you look at the figures from the Super Bowl that, you know, television revenues are not what they had uh, right. thought they would be. Um, I think Neil and I have come to appreciate, after talking to a lot of people, that the success of Coors Field, um, a lot of it has to do with the Rockies and the, and the ownership group. I mean, from what we understand is that a stadium that was being built the year before Coors Field and one that was built the year after are being torn down. But HOK, in terms of trying to anticipate the best fan experience, did the open concourse. And um, I'd like to know how much, well, and certainly taking into consideration millennials view sports differently than my generation or my parents' generation, right. that you all have, I think, tried to anticipate that change. So. Tell me a little bit about yeah. what your vision is for the future and how you see things going. Yeah, so back when Denver paid for this stadium, and I think it was $185 million, is that right? I think that's, something, something and the, like the bonds were supposed to take 15 years to pay it off. It took seven. In fact, that's why we got the new Mile High Stadium, uh, because Pat put in money and took the rest of that tax. So. That tax that they voted on, that they passed, 54 percent, built two stadiums. Right. So that's pretty good. You know, um, growing up in the beef packing business, um, it was we had plants that cost a lot of money. Um, a lot of you know, a lot of capital were put into those plants, and we were always taught that you know. Inflation was going to mean they were going to cost a lot more down the road. So we have always had the belief that we've got to take care of that stadium. And over the, the, the lease was set up that the lease payments and a capital repairs fund would go, which the Rockies paid both of those, the capital repairs fund and the lease money would go into a capital repairs fund. And so uh, that number built up over time, but over the first 22 years of, of the Rocky Stadium of Coors Field, the Rockies spent an additional $50 million on the upkeep of that stadium. Really? Wow. And a lot of teams won't do that. A lot of teams want government entities to do it or whatever. Um, but we knew we had a gym, and we wanted to take care of that gym. And as we saw the 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 outlying area grow in closer to us and the apartments and more people, uh, we knew that that was where we wanted to be, right? Whoever picked that area picked a damn good area. So 
uh, we were going to keep that stadium up. And uh, our lease was for 22 years. Uh, we had five, three five-year options, so it was really for 37 years. Uh, about five years ago, we started talking with the district about, okay, let's, let's extend this lease, but let's extend it 30 years, and let's figure out a method to, to pay. So we had a company come in, they said over the next 30 years, you're going to need 200 million worth of capital. Okay, so where do we get this capital? You know, it's, you go through the sole, all the iterations that you went back way back when, and you know, the ones that people were going to have to vote on, we just didn't feel comfortable with. Uh, we didn't think we could win that. Um, so, you know, there were seat taxes. There were all sorts of taxes that we threw open. We went to Governor, I believe, Hickenlooper, yeah, and said, listen, when you built this stadium, there was a payback, right? There was a payback. Not the payback that paid the $185 million worth of bonds, but it was a sales tax, and nobody was really keeping track of that. But you knew it was there, right? You saw all these businesses perking up there, and we're drawing 35,000 people a game, and they're going out into the community afterwards. So you knew there was a payback. But the one payback nobody ever thought about was the income tax on the players. And our players, our first player payroll was less than $10 million. And if you took that payroll and you inflated it for 22 years at 3 or 4%, you would get to a payroll of $35 million, okay? Well, our payroll was $100 million. So that's $65 million more than anybody would have anticipated if they would have even thought about the player right. payroll. Right. And that's not counting our payroll, which isn't nearly what the player payroll is. But so if you take that $65 million in additional, take, take it times a simple 5%, right? You, you, you know, you've got almost $4 million that the state is getting more than they would be if there wasn't a baseball team here. Forget all the sales tax and all that stuff. So we tried all sorts of different ways to, to uh, you know, figure out a way to get this 200. We, we settled on doing a lease on the West Lot, which we're developing now. But the biggest fact of it is, is that to build a new stadium in Denver or almost anywhere else is going to be, like Coorsfield, is going to be six or seven hundred million dollars. And there is no appetite in any city, any place in this country for the community to pony up six or seven hundred million dollars. You know, maybe you get a part of it, but you'd never get all of it. So the great news for Denver is, is that we worked out something with the district. Denver is going to have baseball. Colorado is going to have baseball for the next 30 years without a dime coming out of anybody's pocket. And that is really a good place to be, not only for Denver, but for the Rockies. Because if we had to build a new stadium, whether it was downtown, and had we not taken care of Coorsville, if we had to build a new stadium, because it was crumbling or it hadn't been kept up and the suites hadn't been kept up, then, you know, we would have been faced with, you know, probably at least half the cost of an 800, 700 or 800 million dollar stadium. So it has worked out perfect. Uh, and I, I give the credit to my dad because he's the one that said you got to reinvest in, in your facility. And a lot of times baseball teams reinvest in the team and forget to reinvest in the facility. Governments sometimes forget to they, reinvest they, in yes, infrastructure too. Uh, that's true, and you know what? That's a good point because, you know, it, it's it, you you've got this budget, okay, and here is you got this budget, and here are your requests, which is double the budget, and you say, okay, well, we got to pay for Medicaid, and we got to pay for the prisons, and you know what? We got to pay for K through 12, and we got to pay something to higher ed. What do we got left? There's nothing left. You know, we'll get rid of the, we'll take care of the roads some other day when it's rosy. And of course, in Colorado, because of Tabor, that rosy day is never going to pay anybody. Right, right. So. Right. Well, we'll have you running for office here in no yeah, time at all. Yeah, there you go, right. <laughs> so, in hindsight, if you had it to do all over again, would you do anything differently? Yes, I would. I, if I knew in, in 1993, 
what I knew in somewhere in 2010, let's say, when when I when we started a baseball team, we would have spent every dollar we possibly could have on our farm system, on drafting the right guys, and building the strongest farm system with draft and develop guys to where we would always have new kids coming in and we'd stay out of the free agency market. But other than that, you know, probably not. Fantastic. Well, very, very good. I, you know, what a great interview you've done, um, Dick. And I think Neil and I, I speak for both of us, really appreciate the Montfort stepping, stepping up when they stepped yeah. up. Um, you know, I think baseball has been very, very good for Colorado. I know when Neil brought me the initial um, thoughts and draft of the right. bill, um, you know, there was an economic development study that said right. $90 million a year. Well, right. I mean, today you look at it, it's chicken right. feed. Right. <clears throat> Not to even mention the quality of life. Right. things that it brings along with us. Well, we've got a great stadium, and that's to the credit of Kelly and Jerry and, and Charlie, but, uh, you know, we, we take care of it. We have passion. We have people that have worked as ushers for 25 years there. Really? We have, the other day, I mean, we haven't even been around 25 years. This is our 25th year coming up. But we have, we have I think the count is now 12 people out of 270 employees that we have, 12 people have worked there 25 years. And every year there's a couple more. So it's those people and their passion and, you know, loving the game and loving Colorado that that make it a joy to do. Right. So well, It was so great that you stepped up because first you had the Monas problem and, right. and then you had right. Warren Benton problem and then you, yeah, right. had, and then you had Jerry had problems and I mean right. you had to keep stepping up to the plate right. every time because, and it yep. wasn't your fault, it was... Right. And it's worked out good problems. for me, but you're yeah. right. They, they they were stretching me a few times along the way there. I'm sure they were. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they were. Well, I think that's pretty much how we kind of see the story coming together, is that, you know, it's a community working together. Right. And that it's not that you're not going to have some obstacles along the way, but you just got to be tenacious and work at overcoming the, yeah. the obstacles. And you know, isn't that right? And isn't that the Colorado way of doing it? I mean, yeah. you make a deal, you just keep, you keep moving forward. And, uh, you know, you, you have an issue and you have a problem and you, you work it out. I mean, even the five years of, of dealing with the district, uh, they represented the state great. In fact, I thought too great. But, <laughs> you know, for us to just keep and, you know, Arizona now has this lawsuit going on in their stadium, right? This guy is suing this guy. They're, they're saying four-letter F-words and about each other, and they're fighting and this and that. And you know what? I was frustrated. The district was frustrated. But at the end of the day, we just had to get a deal. Right. And I would say I gave the most, but, you know, they, they <laughs> we would... We wouldn't expect yeah, you to say anything they, different. They would probably say the same thing, but at the end of the day, Colorado is the... Great Denver is the only city in the United States that is guaranteed baseball the next 30 years. Hmm. That's amazing. Well, it's interesting. As we interviewed Federico uh, Pena and we interviewed Ray Baker, um, it is interesting that they get asked to go to different communities to speak right. about you know, how right. to get a team or how to keep a right. team or whatever. And um, that is the overriding message, that it's people who, at the end of the day, aren't going to shut the government down. They're going right. to figure out a way to work it out. You know, you mentioned Ray. Arizona copied, copied what the dis what what the, the stadium district and the Rockies had. They copied that. They copied that whole lease. And yet they're in a lawsuit. Their stadium is a few years younger than ours, and they're in a lawsuit, and, and it looks like the ultimate from this lawsuit is going to be that 
er, that Phoenix will take the stadium back and they'll go build a stadium somewhere else. Okay? Wow. So where the difference is they're tearing down a $250 million or $300 million stadium and building a new one for seven or 800. What did we do? We took and extended our lease on an older stadium, 30 years, and the taxpayer has no, no cost. I like my story better than your story. <laughs> your story is a lot well, better. Well, and I think, you know, it's one of the reasons that Neil and I think this is a great message in the environment. That